Today is January 5th, 2023, and my guest is poet and lawyer Dwayne Betts. He is the creator of the Freedom Reads Project, an initiative to install curated micro libraries of 500 books in prisons across the country, a project we spoke about on his first appearance. This is his third appearance on Econ Talk. Dwayne was last year in May of 2022 discussing Ralph Ellison and Primo Levi. I want to encourage listeners to go to econtalk.org, where you'll find a link to our survey of your favorite episodes of last year. Dwayne, welcome back to Econ Talk. I know it's always a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm chasing Mike Munger. You're close. <laughs> well, with this third episode, you know, you're on your way. Uh, I lose track. I think Mike's in his 40s, but, you know, just a few more dozen, a couple dozen, well, three dozen, more, well, more than that. But you, I'm not, I, I wouldn't. <laughs> I would never underestimate you, Dwayne. All things are possible. So so we have three topics today. Uh, we're going to talk about, if we get to them, we'll see. We're going to talk about beauty in prison, uh, which is a bit of, uh, to many, would be an oxymoron. Uh, we're going to talk about what's happening with your library project. And then we're going to talk about your latest book, which is quite unusual in many dimensions. That book is Redaction, is the name of it. Let's start with beauty. Now, you recently wrote about beauty in prison in a piece uh, in the New York Times, it, it opens this way, quote, the first morning I woke up in a cell, I was 16 years old and had braces and colorful bands covering my teeth. My voice cracked when I spoke. I was five foot five and barely weighed more than a sack of potatoes. Before my 18th birthday, I'd scuffle in prison cells, be counseled to stab a man, I declined, and get tossed into solitary confinement five times. And still of those years, the memory that endures is the moment a prisoner whose name I've never known slid Dudley Randall's The Black Poets under my cell door in the hole." End of quote. So for listeners who didn't hear your first appearance, and of course we'll link to it, uh, how'd you get to prison at 16? And how did that book that was slid under your door by a stranger who you've never known now and never met how to change your life yeah you know one of the things i find um i find challenging is is as you know as you get older um some of the excuses you make for um your younger self start to wane just because like all of a sudden you're in contact with people who who you think you know could be you right it's almost like you you meet yourself constantly and you know, when I was 20, that wasn't the case because when I would, you know, meet a 16 year old, they they felt like me. And even when I was 25 and when I was 30, um, but now that I'm 42 and that I got a 15 year old, um, that question, how did you end up in prison at 16, is one that um that I find baffling, you know, because because I realized that the answers that I thought made sense no longer make sense. Um, but but the short of it is that um, I carjacked somebody, and it was December 7th, 1986. Um, 1996, and then um, the next day we we got arrested uh, driving. We actually we got arrested at a mall. We were um, shopping with a credit card that didn't belong to us. And um, that's the short answer: is that I carjacked somebody. I got caught. Uh, you know, one of the funny things about um, that people don't realize, you know, they think that 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 you're just wild and, and you run in the streets. I mean, the first thing I did was confess, uh, and, and it wasn't the pressure of having police pointing pistols at me. I think it was that um, I was living in a place where I expected to go to college, wanted to go to college, but it was just much easier to engage in the violence that was around me than, than to avoid it. And it was much easier to imagine that I, I could have a foothold in that world, even if just momentary. Um, didn't, didn't recognize that that thing would change the way I saw myself and the way others saw me for the rest of my life. And so, um, I confessed immediately, uh, you know, didn't even know how much time I would get. Uh, I just confessed so that they would drop some of the charges. And I stood in front of a judge, 16 years old, facing life in prison because um, carjacking carries life in Virginia. And uh, <laughs> I remember I remember sitting on the, um, sitting in my chair and my family got up, a couple people in my family, a um, couple family friends. Um, they explained how I carjacked the man because I didn't have a father. And uh, and my mom, she she didn't she didn't get up and testify on my behalf, but she was in the room. And 
I just, you know, I remember thinking, man, nobody told me to not having a father do me from the, from the jump. And so when the judge asked me what I wanted to say, um, I remember saying, I, I apologize to the victim and I apologize to my mom, you know, and to my family. And, and all I know is I didn't do it because I didn't have a father. But the, the wild thing, and then this is what I've, I've, I've really gotten no further to truly been able to answer is, is I didn't provide the judge for a reason why I did it. I just, I just knew why I just knew what wasn't the rationale, you know? And, um, and anyway, I, I went to prison and, and it's so interesting because it's the most humbling thing in my life. I thought I was so much better <laughs> than, than so many people, you know, my peers, because I was getting good grades, but I was trying, um, I, I thought they were on a path to perdition. I ended up in prison before all of them. And, and it's something that's really humbling when, when, when you get into a place like that and you recognize like that this is your community and, and you got to figure out, man, um, you know, if you hate them, you hate yourself. And so with some torturous, I think about being a 16 year old in this, this God forsaken place and trying to find meaning. And that's why the books became so, so invaluable, you know? Um, but yeah, that's how it happened. That book sliding along the floor that went into your cell door. How long were you, had you been there before that happened? Do you remember? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, definitely. That's one of those things that um, is unforgettable in the sense that, like, I had been reading books all of the time. You know, we all have origin stories, and, and, and I have different origin stories, too. I, I should say, like, one of the first ones was, you know, I when I was, um, yeah, I got locked up when I was 16 in my 11th grade year. When I was in the 10th grade, one of my, my history teacher. Um, caught me reading in the classroom, you know, and I was reading, um, I was reading Sherlock Holmes, you know, I had it under my desk and he came back and busted me. And, um, and I thought he would take my book and yell. And he just said, um, something like to the effect of that's a good book. <laughs> and so, so what happens is I walk up to him and he, and, and um, afterwards, and he's reading a philosophy book and he lets me borrow it. And I remember like being deeply, deeply enthralled in his work of, of philosophy is asking these questions like, how do you know you exist? And I was, I was captured by it, right? And he let me borrow it. And he did two things. He, he, one, he introduced me to this book called, um, called, um, Sophie's World. And it was like this 1500 word, um, book. It was this young girl who, who, who ended up meeting like all of the great philosophers, right? And it was an intro to philosophy book. Um, but I hadn't got my hands on it. And the second thing he did was he, he, um, he, he was trying to organize a trip to the Holocaust Museum for the whole class, um, but the school wouldn't permit it. So then he told us, you know, if you want to come in the summer, you know, if you meet me there, I can get you a private tour. Now, this is like five months before I go to prison, before I carjack a man, you know, before I get nine years in prison. That summer, I go to the Holocaust Museum with this with this teacher, and um, and it's my first experience with with really with understanding what the Holocaust is, but even thinking about what it means to be Jewish as like an idea, as a notion, right? So, I get locked up, and and I'm trying to find a way back, right? And I got this teacher that's telling me I can help you get your high school diploma, and and essentially what my my course of study became with her was. You know, look, you have enough credits to graduate right now. All you need to do is finish 11th grade and say 12th grade English. So I did all of my classes at the county jail, and then she gave me 12th grade English. And what 12th grade English consisted of is reading everything. You know, I'm reading King Arthur. I'm reading Ernest Gaines. I'm reading anything that I want to read and anything that she tells me to read. And she says, what do you want to read? And I said, you know, I want to read this book, Sophie's World. I think about this teacher, and I said, I want to read Sophie's World. And so she's like, okay, I'm going to get you Sophie's World. She comes back like, you know, a week later and she says, I think you're mistaken um, because I was looking for it and I can't find a book called Sophie's World. I think you want to read Sophie's Choice. And Not the same she, book. <laughs> and, and, you know, and I'm like 16 and it's like, woe is me. And then I read Sophie's Choice and my world is blown. And, and I go from from Sophie's Choice to the confessions of that turn. And, and so in my own head, you know, I, I tell this origin story about becoming a poet. But I think the, the reality is even before I had became a poet, something else had to happen, which is I had to get exposed to literature that let me have some sensitivity um, to understanding that it's not just what was me. So this is 1996. It's 1998 when I ended up. Um, so I read Sophie's World. I read Sophie's Choice in 1996. It's 1998 when I'm at the first prison that I'm at. You know, I've been sentenced. Um, I've been transferred downstate to the prison. 
And um, it's something that happened on the yard, and I ended up getting put in solitary confinement. And it was the summer of 1998. Um, books were contraband, so they took all of my books, and, and they didn't let anybody really have books back then. But you would hear guys on the door asking for books. And then people would slide them books, and it was just like an underground library. If, if somebody had a book and you asked for one, they would give it to you. And, and they wouldn't ask you what you wanted. You know what I mean? So I read like so many Reader's Digest books. Um, but I remember I was like, yo, somebody send me a book. And, and then, you know, this poetry book, Dudley Randall's The Black Poets, slides out of my cell. And, but the truth is, though, you know, and, and at first I was like, what am I going to do with this? Mm, read poetry at, you know, I'm 16, 17 years old. I'm in solitary confinement. Um, what is a poem going to do for me? But I, I discovered, you know, Robert Hayden, uh, Claude McKay, Lucille Clifton, Sonia Sanchez, like so many fascinating writers. But the thing that really turned me into a poet was I, I discovered Etheridge Knight. And he had this poem in there called um, For Freckle Face Gerald. And, and, and one of the lines was, 16 years hadn't done a good job on my voice. And I'm a kid when I'm reading it. And, and, and I said, um, with his precise speech and innocent grin, he couldn't quite win a trust or the fists of the black cats around him. And, um, and it's this poem about this 16-year-old kid who ends up getting raped in prison. And, um, and the poem was written in the 70s. And so I was thinking, like, what was me? You know, I'm 16, 17 years old. I'm in prison. And it's a whole cohort of us. And I'm thinking, this is the first time this has ever happened in the world. I can't believe this is going on. And then I read this poem that's about somebody who could have been me um, in the 70s. And, and I just thought, wow, a poem could be history. It could be psychology. Um, and also I read it and it made me grateful for the life that I had, which is, you know, you're grateful for anything in prison, but, um, but I didn't really have precise speech. I didn't have an innocent grin and people loved me even in prison. And, and even in the hole, I knew like, and I was, I was not a tough guy. You know, I was in a hole. <laughs> I mean, I was probably in a hole because somebody had like swung on me and, and I never, you know, I didn't really retaliate, you know, so it's not like I was a tough guy, but I read that poem and I knew um, the thing that the poet did was, was was capture a story that the person who experienced it couldn't because the person who experienced it might not have survived. And at that moment, I was like, you know, this is the thing I want to be. This is the thing I want to do. And, um, and it's really strange to, to, to commit to doing something or being something when you're so young. Um, but, you know, I did. And, and, and all these years later. I committed to being two things, actually. You know, I committed to being a criminal, too, not understanding the decision I was making, and then to be able to commit to being something else and, and had the other thing last longer than the first thing is, is still something that's pretty humbling to me. And it's amazing. Um, so in this piece uh, for The Times, and unintentionally or not, in your what you just said, trying to make a life. You're in prison, but you still make a life. We don't, I think those of us who have not had to deal with that kind of thing just have a very flat stereotype view of what it means to be in that situation, not just in prison, but being convicted of a crime and having an identity suddenly thrust on you or chosen by you that is a unbearable surprise. And yet, there's other stuff going on there. Uh, it's um, it's not as flat as it looks. You um, you write later in that piece talking about Rikers, Rikers President Rikers Island. Quote: The conversations about places like Rikers are usually limited to the violence that takes place there, as if prison, like the streets we walk each day, isn't filled mostly with people attempting to get by, people who reach for beauty in every way they can. During my time in prison, I got into a single real fight. People don't understand how many of us sought to become more than our crimes or how many of us starved for lack of a conduit to the dignity that we sought, end of quote. So what does that mean when you reflect on your own experience and then on your experience of going back into prisons recently with books? And we'll talk about that in more detail, but what does it mean to reach for beauty? Can you can you appreciate that when you're yeah, you there? Know, it's one thing that's really interesting, actually, is, is one of my friends criticized my first book, and he said, yeah, I read it. You know, I read it in a couple of days. And he said, you know, but what got me is uh, this, ain't the, uh, this ain't ours. 
And he was like, prison ain't just us. Now, I read my first book. I mean, I wrote it. And I tried really hard not to make the book Oz, right? But a good friend of mine who had been sentenced to life in prison, you know, his critique was, you didn't capture the, the substance of everything else that's going on here. And, and you know, but I Oz, reflect that. Oz meaning, Oz meaning just a horrific hellhole. Oh, oh yeah. Oz meaning like the, the world of, you know, it's, 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 it's these certain narratives about prison that persist. And, and Oz was a television show that was about um, life in jail. And I'm sure Oz contained more in it than just the horror. But what people know from Oz is sort of the horror. And so the question for him was, as a writer, you know, how complex do you make this portrait? And every decision you make is a choice. And I don't think in the first book I wrote about what it means to reach for beauty. And, and I, But I do think it exists in prison. And it exists in a lot of ways. You know, you see a bunch of grown men playing. They, they didn't really let us play football in Virginia. But, you know, around Thanksgiving, I remember it was just one Thanksgiving, it's snow on the ground, and they let us play football. And, you know, you see a bunch of grown men running around um, playing football uh, and, and of all ages, you know. I mean, it's something that's that's joyful and in, 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 in people trying to recapture their youth. Um, you see people um, playing basketball, but you see people actually like, like I remember walking into a, a, a prison and, and, and this and my cell partner was uh, 56 years old. And um, and I was in my 20s. So so that means that now he's probably in his 80s, you know, but he was crying at a table and it was a circle of men around him. And I just thought something's gone profoundly wrong to, to, to for this guy who's been locked up for 25 years to be crying in public. And um, he had made parole and, and, and nobody made parole during that time. And he was crying and his friends were around him. And so, I, you know, I, I, I think that it's complicated because to, to say something like is there beauty in prison is. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's like like we started this conversation with in a way it's like an oxymoron, right? But um, but there is sometimes beauty. I mean, I remember the first dude that defended me. Um, you know, he was this Alvarezian, El Salvadorian um guy. You know, with tattoos all over his body, and he used to draw roses on an envelope uh, with an ink pen and, and, and get this astonishing depth of detail and shading just by using an ink pen. So I, I do think it's beauty in prison, and I think. Um, you know, you don't want to like trivialize the experience and act like it's just this one thing, but in, 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 in trying to, trying to really engage the world and say how horrific it is, it's very easy to forget that there are these moments, um, of beauty. And it's easy to forget that, you know, in all of the language and the work around criminal justice reform, the thing that people don't really do a lot is we'll, we'll say, what does it mean to actually fundamentally and radically change the lived experience of people inside to say like, like, that's the thing I'm doing. You know, I might not get you out of prison. You know, I might not release, not shorten your sentence. I'm not even advocating for, for, for criminal justice reform. And, and in my current work, what I'm saying is that you need another, you know, you need a, a, another iota of beauty in your life. And, and the vehicle for that literally um, can be a book. Because I think the other moments of beauty I had, it's like when somebody slid that book under my cell. You know, it's these conversations around literature I had. And, and, I mean, I remember a guy called me once. I'm I'm doing a reading in upstate New York. And I was like, I was like, oh, I'm gonna answer this because this is my friend calling me from prison. And I try to answer anytime somebody calls me, which is like the most disrespectful thing you could do ever to an audience, right? <laughs> and I'm like, oh look, man, I'm doing this poetry. I'm like, you know what? You wanna listen in? And I, I put him on speaker so that he could hear me. And and he 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 hears, you know, he hears the audience laughing. Somebody in the audience says, says hi to him, you know, and, and like I mean, I don't think that's that's a moment of beauty. That's a moment of richness. That's an opportunity to be um, more connected to the world. And, and so I, I do think it's beauty in prison. I think that um, it's not enough. And, and I think that we should push, um, because if we push to make it more, I think we remind ourselves of, of, of who we are and, and, and we give ourselves the opportunity to, um, to, to revisit that, 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 that idea of who we want to be um, instead of being stuck, you know, and, um, in the circumstances, so to speak. Um, and I don't want to trivialize the challenge of being a prisoner, but of course, all of us have this challenge of remembering that there's beauty in the world. Very easy to go through life, just missing it. Um, it is everywhere. You just have to pay attention, and paying attention is really hard. Uh, I don't know why it's so hard. Well, it shouldn't be. Um, 
you know, there's some places that are physically more aesthetic than others. There are some places that offer more glimpses of the transcendent uh, and the awesome than others, but almost every place has beauty in it in some fashion. And I think the, uh, what you said reminds me of Emily Dickinson. I think I have this right. My heart stirred for a bird. The idea that, you know, I just, I want, I yearn to see something magical, beautiful, transcendent, awe filled. I don't know. It's, it's, it's a under experience, part of the human experience. And I think it's just because we don't pay enough attention. Yeah. I remember, uh, I mean, I remember once I, I had a bit of a charm life in some ways and, and you got, but everybody has, and it's that, that thing about paying attention. I was just trying to teach my son this notion of paying attention. And, but, but like even the phrase, you know, to pay attention, like, what is it? What is the, 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 the sort of the, the, that vehicle that you have to give the world? What is, what is the, the money that you have to give the world? And it's just your attention. And so what does it mean to pay attention to something and how it is remarkably so much of a choice. And I remember I was in this, this cell at a juvenile detention center before they sent me to, to the adult jail and, and later to prison. I would um, sneak a book in to my cell at night and read it. And I got all caught up in like, you know, like the Jonathan Livingston Seagull books. And so um, I had them in my cell and, and my aunt would send me some and she sent me one of her books. And and the guard, he, he walked past and he saw me read and he chastised me. He just worked the night shift. But then when he opened the door to take my book, he saw what I was reading. And I guess he had read similar books and he was into the books. And so now I had, I had a, a, a friend, you know, he let me keep the book and then he would, I would read and I would fall asleep when I read. And so he would wake me up before shift change and, and, um, and, and, and get the book from me and put it back so that I wouldn't get in trouble. And I remember once he, he gave me the book that I had in my locker and I'm reading it and, and I turn the page, I get to the middle and I swear a dozen fully clovers fell out of the book. You know, because um, my aunt, she, she had taught me how to find 40 flowers. I, I search for 40 flowers to this day, you know, when, I, when I'm walking. I find them pretty consistently, but she would find them and put them in books, and I do the same thing. But I open this book, and like a dozen 40 flowers um, fall out. And, and, and what that reminds me of is it's always that, like, the, the searching for 40 flowers is a decision for her to pay attention and then, you know, putting it in a book and a story in a book and then later to get a book to me. And it was all happenstance. She probably had no clue that, you know, those 40 flowers were in that book because, you know, she had that book 10 years, 15 years before she she gave it to me. Um, so anyway, I do think that you what you do is you wait for moments like that. And um, and you get to choose what, what moments you imagine are remarkable. I, I think a lot of times we, we forget that that we get to choose and it might be. Um, you know, some people might think the 40 flows are trivial. And I, I know because they looked at me sometimes when I'm on the corner sitting down and like, you know, walking my dog and I look and find a 40 clover. They'd be like, what, what, you know, what are you doing? I'm like, well, we're looking for a 40 clover. But for others, it's, it's a moment of, um, of beauty and it captures something that, that matters, you know? Yeah, you're also looking for your aunt, which is pretty beautiful that you can find her on a street corner in Connecticut yeah. somewhere. It's pretty sweet. So, the literal sense in which you are trying to bring beauty, beauty into prisons with the Freedom Reads Project. And so, you know, when I think of it, you know, here at Chalem College, we, we do a, it's a little like what your project is, not quite the same, but there's a a trail like the Appalachian Trail here in Israel. It's called Shvil Yisrael. It's the Israeli tra Israel Trail. And you can go from the full north and south of the country on this trail. And Shalem College, I'm president of, before I got here, I, was, I love this decision. I had nothing to do with it, but I love it. We put out boxes of books on the trail, scattered it along the trail, and and you can go there and pick up a book. It's often a book that maybe always, I don't even remember, but that we've published in in our press. And, um, you know, I'm sure people are walking along and thinking, what's that box? And they go and look at it and they go like, oh my gosh, it's got books in it. It's amazing. Uh, and you're bringing books, you know, into a different kind of wilderness, different kind of desert, different kind of trail. But the part I wanted to emphasize is that you made a decision to make the bookcases that house those books 
beautiful. You know, he didn't just say, well, we'll put a bookcase in a library and we'll have 500 or two bookcases, they'll hold 500 books. You, you designed, somebody designed a gorgeous curved wooden bookcase. We'll put links to the project online, of course, to this episode. You can go look at it yourself, listeners, but you made, they're beautiful. They're really beautiful. Um, they're not practical for me because they, they're not flush to the wall because they're curved, but they're perfect for prison. So talk about that decision and, and why you did that. You know, it really was iterative. You know, somebody said, um, basically somebody said to me, what would you do, you know, in this world if you, if you could have a bigger impact and, and it wasn't about money? And I, I thought, well, I would put, you know, we put millions of people in prison. I'll put a million books in prison. And I thought about the the books. I thought about the 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 like the 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 prison is like a glass, you know, and the people are like water. And I thought of the books like ice cubes. And 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 if you add enough ice cubes to a glass of water, the water overflows, you know. And I thought that that if you add enough books to prison, um, that we might conceptualize on um, what we do to each other. On both ends, too. You know, it's both ends of the spectrum. I think um, people in prison understand harm and violence as, as much as anybody else. I think, um, you know, it's not to just say that the, the world is unjust. It's to say that the world is unjust in really profoundly complicated ways. And and in some ways, what we do with prisons is, 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 is allow ourselves to ignore the injustice. And I just thought the idea of books and bringing more and more books into prison would profoundly alter the way we saw the space and the way people inside saw the space. I thought a lot of things were happening. So then I was like, okay, well, how will you do this? You know, will you just do a bookshelf? And I was thinking it was going to be a 500 book collection. Um, Sir Walter Riley had 500 books when, when he was at the, um, you know, Tower of London. And I thought like 500 books is, is, is a sufficient number of books to like, you know, especially if they're great books, if they, if they have weight to them, it's a sufficient number of books to carry you through a stretch of time. And I also thought it was, I'm, I'm I'm pretty well read, but I have huge gaps um, just based on not having the opportunity to to read some books when I had the time. And I thought, yo, you know, prison is a lot of time. Um, and I also thought that books fundamentally are, are just so much better um, at changing people's minds and the way they see the world than arguments. And so I was like, what kind of books? And it was mostly fiction and poetry, you know, some philosophy and some nonfiction, but mostly fiction and poetry because I think a novel, I think, you know, for me, like reading reading Sophie's Choice made me much better understand like what it meant to carry the experience of the Holocaust around than, than read some nonfiction would have. I think reading, um, and you, you know, we could all go down the list. But then the question was, okay, so you're going to put the books in, how will you? And at first I was going to do a bookshelf, like a case that's on the wall, um, on your wall behind you. And then I thought, well, but that's taking up so much space. You know, people in prison, they, they doing push-ups on the wall. So the, the wall is like valuable space. They leaning against the wall to talk. Um, and then the thing is, if you go to your bookshelf, you know, you exist at your bookshelf and it's you communing with the books, right? It's not a it's not a community that gets built from that experience. Maybe one person stands beside you, but but y'all shoulder to shoulder, y'all not looking at each other in the face. And again, it's it's just like two people that get to take up all of that space. Um, so I thought, okay, I, I don't want it up against the wall. So then decided not to have it up against the wall, I had to deal with with prison. I had to deal with um, blind spots on uh, the Prison Rape Elimination Act and the fact that you can't obscure sight lines. And so that led me to think, okay, well, now it has to be 44 inches high. And I thought, well, what if, and, and I'm working with Mass Design um, at the time, the, the the architecture and design firm that, you know, built Brian Stevenson's memorial, that's built hospitals around the world um, and doing a, 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 one of these silent gardens at Gallaudet. Uh, they do some, some interesting things that, and I was working with this guy named Jeffrey, this architect there. And, and we settled on like, you know, 44 inches high and, and, and thinking to make it curved, riffing on Martin Luther King's, you know, the, the arc of the universe bands towards justice. And, um, but the thing is, by doing it that way, one, we could maximize the number of books we could get in a small space because we could make the book, the book accessible on two sides. Um, but also by making it curved, um, the typical library has three book, bookshelves. And, and around three bookshelves that's curved 44 inches high, six to seven people could just browse at one time. And what happens is when, you, when you're looking at those books, you're not just looking at the books, you're looking at the person across from you. And it literally creates a space. And then the question was, well, what would the material be? And, and I, I got really obsessed with material. I was like, well, we're going to make it out of wood. 
We're gonna make it our hardwood. We're gonna use like maple and walnut and and oak and cherry. And, and the reason was because the the wood lasts forever and it's beautiful. When you go into a prison and it's just straight lines and right angles and it's just like steel and concrete and um and and and, and like plastics, right? And so I was like, we're gonna use a wood, something that that. You know, every time I see one, I, I put my hand on it and I touch it because it is, it's, it's life that's coming out of it. And, and a lot of people argue with me and say, well, I mean, why don't you just get Ikea bookshelves? You know, if you got Ikea bookshelves, then, then you could do this thing. And I was like, well, you know, if we got Ikea bookshelves, um, one, the prison won't permit the Ikea bookshelf, frankly, because it's, that's usually made by veneer and um, and, and the, the shelves are really, really thin and they can become weapons. Um, but two, it'll miss the depth of beauty, you know, and, and then it actually missed the process that goes into the construction. And so at this point, um, the the production of one of these is, is a journey for everybody involved. You know, it's this transformation of the wood. It's the, the labor of the people's hands who are literally um, crafting these things that are beauty. And, you know, um, I, was, I was thinking about that, that biblical story um, where it was like somebody washes this. Um, I can't even remember the story because I, I don't, you know, I don't, um, I, I know the story actually. I think it's, it's, it's a, a woman is uh, like washing Jesus's feet with her hair or something, you know. And um, and I forgot what they said the story meant, what it was supposed to mean. But what I think about it is just like, who is to say who is worthy of a beautiful thing? You know, who gets to, to decide that question? And when you anybody who's engaged with this project, you know, when you're working on it, you're building it. I mean, this is the most beautiful thing that is in the house of most people that I know. You know, nobody has something that's this beautiful. So when you work on it, you know that your design is something that, that has the kind of attention to detail, the kind of care, and the kind of cost that exceeds what a lot of us are capable of bringing to our home. And frankly, none of us will bring this into our home because it is not efficient, you know? And so you work on this thing and you know that it's something that's profoundly beautiful and it's always, it forces you to ask, so does this person deserve this? And in every step of the process, you say yes, and you say they deserve it. Not even because they've done something that's like, you know, this is the most brilliant scholars in prison, or these are the most thoughtful human beings. No, I mean, they deserve it because it says something about how we want people to be treated and, and seen in the world. And so um, so at the end of the day, you know, you, you, we have actually seen it transform spaces. Um, and, and not to, you know, not to act as if it's like this truly existential moment for everybody, but it is, uh, existential, a sort of transformative experience. I think for, for a lot of people, it creates the opportunity, um, uh, for, for like, you know, you, you read Ellie Paul's work too. I think it does create the opportunity, um, for transformative experiences for so many people that's involved. And we put one in for the staff as well, you know, and, and, and I think the thing that's radical about that is we used to have a saying when, when, when the CEO was getting on our nerves, it's like, you're doing life too. You know, you're just doing it eight hours at a time. You know, where your cell phone at? You know what I mean? But if you want to reach your wife right now, how you going to do it? Um, you come in here with a plastic bag that has to be see-through because they don't trust you no more than they trust me. And, um, and, 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 and you know, correctional officers have a higher rate of alcoholism, higher rate of domestic violence, higher rate of stress, than people in a lot of professions um, in this world. And so by bringing one in for them too, um, you know, it's just radical. You get to see uh, uh, just a moment. I've seen it. Just to get to see a moment that, that they're saying like, damn, you know, this is a bit of light in, in a dark place. And it's light in a dark place, not just for people that's doing time, it's light in a dark place for people that works there. And, and the really radical thing, if it ever gets to this point, is the kind of permissions that it gives you. You know, when you put a library in a housing unit, I think it gives permission for the men there to see each other as more than just, you know, criminal, convict, spades player, athlete, um, but, to, but to see to see a person in public as a reader, because you don't have wide access to the library. Um, and then if you get to the place where the COs get a chance actually to read, and that's a part of the, the ethos and the structure of, of the day for them, then I think that they get to see themselves as something other than the jailer. You know, and, and the people doing time get to see the CEOs as something else. They get to publicly be seen as a reader. You know, it's only one CEO the whole time I, I served time that I saw as a reader. You know, he was the guy who um who worked at the door, uh, 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 you know, who, who worked at the door if you wanted to go to the law library. And he would have these books every day and they would be on his desk, but he would have them turned over. 
as if it was like, as if it was like illicit material. And I would be like, what do you read? Why you don't want us to know? You must be reading one of them romance novels. <laughs> and like, and, and I was, I was, I was a GED tutor at the time. So every time I came in, I would mess with him about his books. And, and he was, you know, he was kind of a hard ass and, and people disliked him because he took his job seriously and he would search you and, and he felt like he was responsible for making sure contraband wasn't passed back and forth. Um, and so people disliked him and I, I didn't care because I wasn't passing contraband and, and he had these books. And so I would just mess with him every single time. And, um, and then I got an opportunity to work in a law library, but he had to approve whoever was going to get hired because it was like, I, he was like, look, if I don't approve the person, that they can't get hired because I think that if you work in a little library, you got access to computers. Um, so you can make gambling tickets and things like that. And he was like, I just need to trust the person. I'm this young kid and me and him, my whole relationship had just been like me messing with him over these books. And then when I go up for the job, he okays me to get the job. And, and, and I know a lot of it had to do with just this back and forth that we had about me trying to discover what he was reading and him not telling me. And, and I, but I worked in a law library and that's how I learned how to do legal research. And I ended up going into law school. And so years and years later, I ended up going to Yale Law School. And so it's just this way in which I think everything is interconnected and, and, and it create this space of beauty creates kind of opportunities that I couldn't even predict on the front end. Um, but I know will happen on the back end. So how many books have you put into prison so far, roughly? How many libraries have you been able to to, yeah, it, to... So it's actually been really radical because we started out the first time you and I talked. I mean, we were at uh, we were part of Yale Law School and um and then we separated and now we are independent 501c3. And you know, and it was an idea. It was like it was like all a dream. Um but but you know at this point we've done 60 libraries. Um, uh, across seven states and 19 prisons. Um, later this month, we're doing, uh, and, you know, and I, I do say it's, a, it's an experience and it's, it's labor, right? When I say that um, we have these things called freedom ambassadors and the freedom ambassadors are like, you want to be able to come into a prison and not be a voyeur. So for instance, um, we did 11 libraries at a women's prison in, in Connecticut. They got 11 housing units. We put a library on every housing unit. I mean, but that's 5,000 books. And, and that's, you know, um, 33 bookshelves, right? And, and so that's, you physically picking them up and taking them into a space and that's labor. And so we work in with the staff, different relationship, but if it's 5,000 books, that means it's hundreds of boxes and you open the boxes and you're taking the plastic out. And so when people come inside to support the work, sometimes, um, they, they are our ambassadors. And, and you can't put books on the shelf without talking to the people around you. So a lot of times we end up getting in conversations with the staff. We get in conversations with the people inside. We tell them about the project. Um, but yeah, so at this point we've done 60 and, and like we're doing 18. It's, it's a two day stretch later this month. We'll do um, 18 in a men's prison um, in California. And then there's a women's prison across the street and we're doing five there. Um, we'll come back and do more at that women's prison, but over two day stretch, you know, we'd be putting in 23 libraries. Um, so, so yeah, we we have gone from this thing being a dream and an idea to actually having states reach out to us and say, you know, how can we make this happen? Um, and it's the South. It's, we we're gonna be in North Dakota <laughs> in a few months. So um, you know, we've been to Colorado, we've been to Angola and Louisiana, um, and we and we hire people who just came home. You know, it's a couple guys who who working with Freedom Research been their first job, and 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 one of the most deeply moving things. You know, I did my my solo show in Angola at the, um, they got, they got a rodeo in Angola that they do every year. And so they got this rodeo space and I did my solo theater piece there. But what has been, you know, really interesting for me is like at Angola, one of our guys, um, this guy named James Washington, he did 25 years, there. got locked up when he was 15. So he, he grew up in Angola, he just came home and, um, you know, we go there and he built them with his hands and, and, and and he started doing woodworking when he was in prison. And so we returned with these walnut, like these beautifully handcrafted walnut shelves. And I see him interacting with dudes that he's known, you know, for years. Um, it was deeply, deeply, deeply meaningful and powerful. And, and having him there, I think, um, just made me recognize that, you know, when you talk about that search of beauty and that want for beauty, um, it is persistent. And, and it's evident that it brings people joy um, when you see a circumstance like that, when you see somebody like him bringing them in, 
you just see this immediate connection. So, so yeah, we're really excited about the work. And I think we did 50 libraries last year. We'll do um, 150 this year. What's the total? Do you have a goal? Yeah, we have a goal. I mean, so the goal is really to saturate prisons. You know, and, and I think sometimes it's people don't understand. Saturate? You say saturate? Saturate. Because, like, uh, you don't want to create more inequity. So if, uh, if people don't understand why we put them on housing units, we put them on housing units because a lot of prisons do have libraries. Um, but the libraries are open from 8 to 5. And if you have a full-time job, then you don't go to the library. And if you got a prison with, like, a 1,000 people in one library, it's impossible for all of those people to regularly go to the library anyway. Um, but more importantly, we think about this combination of books and beauty and what does it mean to witness somebody being a reader because the, the readers go to the library. Um, but then even when you go to the library, will you get exposed to the idiot? You know, will you get exposed to the odyssey? Um, will you randomly pick up, you know, it's a great book, uh, a gentleman in Moscow, you know, will you, will you, if you never heard of it, then how do you know about it? You know? So, so by us putting curating this 500 book collection, I think we, we basically curating opportunities. And so each prison will have, like between six housing units and 10 housing units. And so if we say that we want to saturate because we don't want to create more inequity, then we always try to put libraries on like 60% of the housing units, right? So that it could be a thing that people experience and not just some special thing for, for this group of prisoners who are working in the kitchen or for this group of prisoners who are taking college courses. It could be something that's democratic and it's for everybody. And so if you just take the number of state prisons, it's, it's 1,500 state prisons. And you multiply it out, you know, we talk about trying to build 10,000 libraries. Um, and, and so I, I do say, you know, we have a goal. The moonshot is to make this a part of the lived experience of somebody who does time. You know, suffering is a part of the lived experience of somebody who does time. Um, but I do think books were my conduit to become a different person. Um, books were a conduit to me understanding myself better and understanding the world better. And so we want to make that opportunity I'm present in anybody's experience of incarceration. And so, yeah, our moonshot goal is um, sometimes I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm like, I don't even want to say it out loud, you know, because it's a, it's a significant cost. Um, it's a, it's a logistical nightmare. You know, I've, I've found myself now um, really deeply understanding woodworking in a way that I had no idea about it. You know, when I started a project, uh, understand like what it means to, to ship project product products from like from Connecticut to Colorado, from Connecticut to California, you know, and I and I also understand something about um, what it means to try to build a labor force, right? Um, and so if I articulate the the big goal, it, it, it feels a little bit um overwhelming. But the big goal is is to do five, ten, fifteen thousand of these libraries because um, that becomes five, ten, fifteen thousand opportunities, not just for people in prison to discover books and beauty, not just for people who work there to discover books and beauty, but um but for us to make it more um more porous, you know, the 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 these the the wall that separates um prisoners from those on the outside becomes far more porous um, with a project like this. And I think I think that's meaningful for for all of us. And and, and you know, even if you just have you, you hate to use yourself as an example, but like two, three, four, five 20, 30 people get to have some of the experiences that I, I've had in this life, you know, both when I was in prison and since I've been home. Um, I think that it had been something of a, of a, of a, of a life well lived if, if I could be the, the, the vehicle for others to get to experience some of this stuff. Do you hear from people who are reading the books? Do you know if they're being read? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, I mean, so it's been occasions where, like, we've sent books out before they've been published. You know, um, Honoré Jeffers, uh, I think her, her book won the National Book Award, but um, the the love songs of W.E.B. Du Bois, you know, her publisher gave us, like, 30 copies, and we sent it to a, a group of guys in a prison in Texas, and they read it before it came out, and they wrote her these handwritten notes, you know, about the book. And um, but I, I once did a Zoom uh, with, with, with women in, with women in, in, a, in a different Texan, Texas prison. I once did a Zoom when we first did the library, one of the first places we put one at, it was a, it was a, 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 a segregated housing unit, right? Um, and it was for people who were in protective custody. And, and when I started this, I, I wasn't actually even, I was thinking about myself, you know, so I was an NPC. Um, and I spent a lot of time in a hole, but I was thinking about myself in general population. And then in collaborating with the DOC, you know, it was like, well, we need to put one in segregated housing. You know, these guys never go to the library. 
they they know and, and they they live their lives in a cell, you know, um, because they're afraid or because they have and they have legitimate reasons to be afraid a lot of times. So um, so they set up a Zoom call with me and these guys, right? And one of the dudes knew my name and he had read my book and he got to argue with me about like, why well, wasn't my book in the library? He was like, you know, this all mattered a whole lot more when I realized that you had did it because you know, I read your book. It, it was kind of good too. <laughs> I was like, kind of good. <laughs> But but it was this guy. No, it was, I'll never forget this, man. It was this guy, this old white dude. He was like, and everybody, it was like an AA meeting. You know, everybody introduced themselves and said how long they had been in prison. And I also thought that I did the project for, for the kid that was like me. But what I found is the project has ultimately been for, for the me who, if I was still in prison, you know, the, the people that I've talked to the most about this work have been people who've been locked up for 20 years and 25 years. And this guy says, you know, I've been locked up for 27 years and and I don't know if you know this, but I'm Italian. And I was like, why would I know that? <laughs> you know? And um, he said, man, but I picked up this book, Barskins. He's like, you know, this novel, man, is about a town. It's just like the town where my family comes from. And he started telling me how he had been inside for so long that he had forgotten where home was. And because we had that book in the collection, he was, you know, saying that he reconnected with that space. And so, so it's been interesting, man, talking to people about it. Um, and we have some videos online. Uh, we got a newsletter. You can subscribe to the newsletter. We try to, you know, produce, um, stories to give you a glimpse of, of what it means. Um, and, and it is, it's, it's always, um, it's always sort of humbling, um, because people, when you go in and you, and you unbox the books, one of the things you hear is, I wonder if that book is there. And then, and then they'll find it be like, oh man, I'm, I, I didn't think you was going to have this with, you know? And, and, and sometimes it's like, I always wanted to read this and, and you know, 500 books is, is something for everybody to discover that they'd never heard of. Um, but it's, I, I snuck Adam Smith in there. You know, we had talked about this before. Um, I snuck your book on Adam Smith in there. Though. That's, how, that's how I snuck Adam Smith in there through your book as opposed to like the actual Adam Smith book because it's, it's really dense. But I, I think, you know, the thing is somebody's going to pick that up. And, and I just remember being introduced to the idea of what it means to be lovely. And so somebody will pick that up and get introduced to the idea and it will literally, I know, carry them through a bunch of days. So, so yeah, we gotten feedback and the feedback has been, has it had, I mean, right now it's been consistently good just because, um, you know, for better or worse books are not grenades, yeah. you know, um, man. I, I, I was preparing for this interview. Um, I just interviewed um, Tiffany Jenkins. You haven't heard it yet, Dwayne, because it hadn't come out yet, but I interviewed her yesterday. It's about the British Museum and other museums that have stuff from the past that they haven't returned and, or excuse me, they're being pressured to return, like the Elgin Marbles from the Parthenon and many, many, many other things like it. And in the course of her book, there's a little history of, of museums and the desire to collect. And she tells a story in there, I didn't get to talk about it on air, so I'm cheating a little bit and I'm adding it here uh, about Hans uh, Sloan, whose collection becomes the British Museum. When he dies, this is a guy who lived, I think, 1660 to 17-something. And he's a collector. He's a crazy collector. He's got 50,000 books and 17,000 pieces of something, and he collects everything. And he, for a while, his since the British Museum didn't exist and he was the collector, his house was the museum and people would come to his house and the composer Handel who wrote, you know, the Messiah and other great works of music supposedly came to his house, but put a buttered muffin on top of one of the manuscripts <laughs> in his collection, <clears throat> which he didn't like, uh, and, yeah. you know, <laughs> and I'm reading that I'm, or I've heard it from, I read it, I guess. And then I heard it. Uh, talking to Tiffany, we didn't get it in the episode, but you know, I'm thinking I can relate to that because I think I've told the story before. When I was when I was uh, seven years old, I threw a book, uh, tossed it across the room, and my dad gave me spanking. And um, I never threw a book again. And I've always thought of books as something sacred, as something that you don't put a butter muffin on and you don't throw them. And when you read them, you don't crack the spine and you treat them with uh, deep, deep respect. And as I was thinking about talking to you about this, you know, I'm thinking, why is it that you and me, and we're not alone, 
Why do we think of books as so special, as so potentially transformative? It's part of the reason I'm president of a college that emphasizes actually reading books, that not just hear it about them in a lecture. You know, our students are in small seminars where they actually read the books. It's really a novel, pardon the pun, novel idea. And sure, books change your life and they, you know, they've changed mine, obviously. I don't think that's the reason. I, I think I think I have, and I suspect you do as well, something close to a religious attitude toward books that you know, they represent in many ways the highest form of human achievement, that, that we can speak and have language is extraordinary, that we can somehow communicate across Connecticut to Jerusalem is extraordinary, that we can preserve our thoughts and ideas with, with little black lines inside something you can hold in your hand, and you give that to someone and it shakes them up or lifts their spirits or shows them a future they might have, or teaches them about the human heart in conflict with itself. It's a it's magic, and and so I have a radical um, view of books that your project, you know, moves me deeply because I believe in it. It's not rational, right, to think that a person's going to pull a book off a shelf, read it before he goes to bed at night and change. But I believe in it. And, and and I think it could be true, but I want to believe in it much more than than I have reason to believe in it. What what is and, that? And I, yeah, and for me though, I, I like I, I like want to believe in it. And actually I want to believe in it independent of whether or not it's true. Like like it it provides me solace, the very notion that, you know, like I said a book is not a grenade. And 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 and, and people would not argue about the kind of damage that a grenade could do, the kind of damage that a bullet could do, um, or, or the kind of relief that those things might provide if if you're dealing with like some, uh, you know, war, some some wars are legitimate, right? But to believe that a book could have that same kind of weight, you know, could, could have that same kind of influence, could have that same kind of significance. And, and also, I, I just fundamentally think that like, books say something about who is present, in the world at a particular time. And, and I think it's our only way of remaining present in the world, even when we leave. If we say that, you know, you're alive as long as somebody still is telling your story. Well, books are the way that, um, that that story gets told, you know, for perpetuity, you know, until the, until the books disappear, the story is, is always there. So I actually feel like, you know, the, the lasting footprint um, of civilization, you know, in some ways is marked um, by the book as a kind of permanence. Um, and then also, I just think, honestly, the, the, the real reason why I've done all of these things in my life, you know, and it's, it's so strange that the most significant things in my life have come um, via the book. But those things haven't been predicted. You couldn't predict it from the beginning, you know, um, like that black poets comes into my life and I become a poet. You, you can't predict that. Or I'm looking for Sophie's world and I read Sophie's choice. And it connects me to the heritage and the history of the very person that introduced me to Sophie's world. You know, I understood more about the Holocaust from reading Sophie's Choice in a real way than I did from going to the museum. I mean, I understood something about the legacy, the horror, the actual fact of it having occurred. But reading Sophie's Choice made me carry it around with me in my head and my heart for a long time. And this, and Sophie's Choice, more than a museum, is why I remember that teaching, right? Um, so I think that these books that they just they, they it, the first time I was out, I, I was on the front page of the Washington Post in 2006, it was because I started a book club for boys, you know, and and like the stuff that happened from my engagement and interaction with books, it, it hasn't been transactional, and, and I think that's what you know what we share. But I think anybody who loves books recognizes that their relationship with the books has never been transactional. But often it has provided these kind of um, of rewards that people carry with them, even if it's just like, even if you know, like, you like, you know, you're not obsessed with books the way um, some of us are. But but you remember that one book. You remember the time my my kid comes up to me last night and he's like, "Yo, can I I'm ask you something?" Uh, I'm reading this book and, and, you know, we were going back and forth about like, yo, you know, come sit down and read with me and it's on a break. And he's like, I want to play Minecraft. And so he's having to come sit down and, and read with me. 
I'm reading the stand because my um my older son he loves the loves Stephen King and he likes the book the stand and he was like I want you to read this and it's like 1500 pages and I'm like I don't want to read this but um I'm reading it and I'm finding it fascinating and my younger son is beside me reading this book and last night he says um can you give me part two of this book and and it's just that even just the 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 the, the, the fact that a book can give you desire to go deeper into another world it's just something that doesn't exist in the same way um that anything else in this world look um it, it's, it's nothing else that that does it quite the same way i mean it's strange i mean i got this book this is like it's like the walk you know and it's a cookbook right but it's a it's a book it's an exploration into this person's life you know like the very idea of a book just um it's wild how satisfying it's wild how 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 people literally can build lives um around 300 pages and 400 pages. And I think it says something about, um, it is it's, 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 it's in itself just a beautiful notion, you know, that you can build your whole life around trying to um, put words on a page and imagine somebody else will read it and in the reading um, experience a, a slice of your mind. I think it's something just um, irreducibly beautiful about that. Talked a little bit recently about communication. We talked with Patrick House about consciousness and how we assume the person across the table is hearing the words that we're hearing because we're saying them and we know they can hear them, but they don't hear the same words. They don't conjure up the same images. Their mind is wandering and they're filtering it in a different way. And the the idea that you could write those words on paper and someone would actually understand them is miraculous <laughs> it is, and profoundly human. Again, there's nothing, I don't think this, you could argue there's really nothing more human than that. Um, it is our highest expression, our highest action, activity. Um, let's turn to your latest project, which is um, a book called Redaction. Uh, it's a collaboration with you and an artist uh, explain the collaboration, how it came about. Yeah, you know, it's, it's really interesting. So Titus Kafar is the artist I'm working with, and he lives in New Haven, too. And, um, and you know, we're friends. And and I think that, um, you know, maybe in the back of our head, we always wanted to do something together. But how do you figure out the thing to do? And and particularly with, like, visual artists and poets, because always the, the challenge is, is the poetry going to be a substrate for the art, or would the art become a substrate for the poetry? And, um, and he was in Maine at Bowdoin College and um, at a, a residency and he was messing around with printmaking and he, you know, called me up and said, hey, won't y'all come to Maine, you know, take a vacation down here, me and you could go in the studio. And so we went and we started um, doing some work together and messing around with, you know, um, using silk screening and etching to combine the poetry and the art. And I was, I was doing these poems, these redacted poems, and they were really visually arresting. And so it was like, oh, this is perfect because the redaction poems uh, they were based on these class action lawsuits where people were, were challenging um, Bill and, and challenging being locked up um, and, and, and held because they couldn't pay traffic tickets, they couldn't pay court fees, or they couldn't pay low-level um, bail, right? And, um, and, and these, you know, I was, I was struggling with the fact that I was a lawyer or studying to become a lawyer, and, um, and I thought that these cases were compelling, but they were filled with legalese, you know, and it's a 50-page document and frequently it's not going to be decided on, on the heart of the matter. It's going to be decided on some legal point, you know, some, something that really felt like minutia. And so I was messing around with redaction. And I was like, well, what if we redacted to get to just the salient points? And we didn't redact to um, obscure what was in a text, but we redacted to reveal what was in a text. And so I started, you know, redacting these court documents and then working with Titus, was like, oh, what if I put the etchings of people behind that? You know, so it's almost like you get this doubling. You get the voice and the, and the image, but they're both pushing in the same direction. And in uh, the mugshot, is this classical, um, uh, the, you know, the reason why they do mugshots and, and driver's licenses is that picture in that way because you get most of the face. And, and you could really, you know, like, like as opposed to a side view or something like that. But we turned the mugshot into a stigma um, because when you see somebody, you say, that's a mugshot. And it was like, what if we did that 
but we made it beautiful and we did these portraits of people and they wouldn't necessarily be the people that were involved in the case, but you could imagine it. And then he, he doubled it. So, so anyway, so we, we do this project and, and me and him are just messing around and we go and we meet with Sarah Suzuki at, at um, she's a, a curator. She works at um, MoMA at the Museum of Modern Art. And we just go and meet with her because because she was familiar with Titus' work and she knew Titus. And um, we just go to talk to her about the project. So this is, um, I guess it's like 2018 maybe. Um, I think it's like 2018, uh, yeah, 2018, 2019. It's 2019. So we go meet with her like January 2019. She said, oh, this would be great, but you know, um, our calendar for MoMA for exhibits is like two or three years down the line, but you could go to MoMA PS1 and we could do this. I mean, we could do this this year. Now, mind you, we just went to talk to her about the idea and we just had some testers that we had done. Uh, she says, um, so then she sets up a call with the person that runs MoMA um, PS1. And they're like, yo, we could do, we would love to have y'all be a part of this exhibit that we want to put up in March. I'm clerking for a federal judge in Pennsylvania and Philly, you know, um, and right now this is just the idea in our head. This is not like anything finished. And now this is January. We got from January to March to find a printer who could do this, right? To find a master printer who could actually work with us to produce these things. And, um, and man, it was uh, like a three, four month period of my life that was wild. I mean, some days I would be for, for hours each day, I would be in Connecticut, New York and Philly, you know, just going back and forth. Um, but it came out and, and we did 50 prints. And typically, you know, you because each poem was about five to eight pages long. So we did a print for each poem and it sort of the process developed and we printed on black paper and it was beautiful. Um, but we did it and the exhibit was up and, and people came and it was it was great. But then we realized that this, you know, if you're not in New York and you never heard a moment PS1, you would never see this. And so we decided to do a book. And we wanted the book to be a, a object of beauty and, 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 and to be something that was also like, uh, so if you, and when you, when, when readers get it and, and they should get it, cause I think it's beautiful. Um, you know, me and Titus put some money into it to reduce the cost, uh, because we, it's three different kinds of paper in the book. Um, you could just print with four colors, but we print it with like seven or eight colors. Um, we print it on black paper and the redaction pieces, which were on black paper in, in the exhibit, we put it on black paper here but we also didn't put an image on two, on each side of the page. We wanted the image just to be on one page so that, um, you know, if you wanted to cut it out and put it on the wall, you basically got a mono print. We use cold glue. So the book opens up flat on each page. You don't have to worry about breaking the spine when you open it. You know, we use cold glue to facilitate like really enjoying the book. And, um, and then we use, uh, we, we got, you know, three sections that's retrospectives on his work and my work. And at first I was going to use all old poems. It was going to be poems from previous books. Um, but then I, you know, we got to working on the project and, and I was like, man, I, I, I like these new poems I'm writing. And so, um, and so now the book has all new poems from me, um, about 40, 50 poems. It has all the redaction pieces in it and it has a bunch of Titus's work. In. And I, it's interesting. Like, I was, I'm really proud of it in, in a way, because, um, like I, I said, um, you know, I, I, I was in a prison and I went into this prison and I had my four books. And when I read from the first three collections of poetry, you know, each each poem, it was hard for me to read. And I felt like like the poems weren't doing what I wanted them to do to an audience that read it. You know, it's, it's sort of like if a, a drowning man doesn't want to, want to hear about the story of a drowning man necessarily, you know. And I got to the redaction poems and, and I could just feel the light lift in, in the space because I, I knew that I had written these poems um, to have some joy in it. And it was my first time, actually, really, as a writer. My wife tells me this a lot. It's like, you, you know, you write about prison a lot. But what about writing about something that has some 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 light in it? And um, and this was my first time really pursuing it. And 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 I wasn't even pursuing it to collect a, a book. I was just writing for a friend who was going through something and and trying to write in that way, maybe pay attention to the world in a different way. And I remember just reading those poems in this prison, and a, and the whole room changed, man. You you can see it on people's faces, and by the end, they were like, "Well, where where's our copy?" You know, and and. I was reading from, and it was not out yet. So I, I was like, I don't have copies for you guys yet, but I can't wait to actually, um, you know, we made it cloth bound so that it has, it has the feel of a hardback book, but, um, but it's not a hardback book because you can't get hardback books in prison. And so we did all of these like subtle things, and even in the book, um, you know, it's one of the pages we considered a book, the, the third exhibit of redaction. And, and, and which is just to say that, um, you know, when you hold it, it's like we like to believe that holding it is a combination of going to a poetry reading and going to a museum. 
And even the poems, I hung the poems on a page um, without titles um, in the same way that you hang art on the wall so that um, it becomes a, a running commentary. But you experience the poem in, in a different way, I think, than you typically would experience the poem. Uh, I'd like you to read one of them. Um, uh, you have a poem that's first line is, we waited without a name. Now, I think, I think, Dwayne, I might be wrong. When you read a poem on your first appearance here, you, you're, the, we were, I think it was your first appearance, we talked about Fallon, which was a, a poetry collection of yours. And it's it's dark, uh, as you were saying. And these these poems in this new collection, ironically, perhaps, or, or the redaction poems are, are dark. Obviously, they're 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 um, a little bit harrowing. They're 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 poignant. They're powerful. Uh, but they're mixed in with these new, uh, not redacted, but full poems of yours. Um, but I think when you read the first one, I think you read it from memory, and I think yeah. you changed it a little bit. And it and Dana Joya the poet who was on here also changed when he read one of his poems, he read it. So I don't know if you're going to read, which, which I love, by the way, one of my favorite moments of, of hosting the show is to have a poet write a poem on the show, essentially read it just a little bit differently than how he wrote it as a, as a unique moment. But, um, so I don't know if you're going to read, we waited without a name by heart, or whether you're going to read it off, a. Uh, of text, but uh, I'll take it either way. All right, cool. Let me see what I can do. Um, we waited without a name for your wonder. And after your birth, after you entered this world wailing like the dragons, your tiny hands reaching for light at the jumbo jets hour, we waited. And three days passed without words to announce this gift. And I read poems to myself and didn't think of the compass I'd give you years later or the compass you become for me in that afternoon. For the first time, I was not lost. Just discovering a story to tell myself about the world. Aren't we always looking for a story to tell ourselves? Isn't a name just a shorthand for a myth? We gave you two words. A word in each tongue. The English, a translation for the Hebrew or vice versa. Each, the name of the uncle you'll never meet. The names pulled from the book. Some wonder. When I held you, your little body, was neither well nor how, but so fragile and unafraid of these shivering hands or the warm water that I bathed you with. The light that spilled from your mother's belly, patient and smiling then, as if you knew you were the first song to find me worthy. That's just so beautiful. Um, I had nothing to say. I was going to ask you about names, but forget it. I'm not going to ask you about names. D did you read that? Did you just recite that from heart by heart? Uh, it's, it's, it's actually in my show. So it's like 50-50, you know. You're saying, because we, we did not give anybody the background on that. You did a solo show, and you're saying in that solo show, you would, this was one of the things. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I know that one. You know that one pretty it's, well. It's, it's, just, it's interesting too, though, because like before I did my solo show, so I did a solo show based on like my life in the book Felon. And the reason why I did it is, is, is also I recognize that like literacy moves up and down. And, you know, I want to go into a prison and do the show and, 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 and entice people for what they will get from inside of a book, right? And being a poet, you know, my folks would be like, yo, you, you're a poet, say a poem. And for years, I, I couldn't. If I didn't have my book, I, I couldn't give you a poem. And so... Part of doing a solo show was was to try to stretch as an artist, and that's been fascinating too. But that's one of the poems that's that's in the show, um, and so that's that's one of the reasons. I mean, this the, the reason why I was able to do the poem by heart the first time and this time is because you know trying to become and becoming a performer has made me like value the art of memorization in a way yeah. that I hadn't before. 
And so now I know everybody's work, you know, I, I like everything. I like the Ethers Night poems. I, I know those by heart. I know. So anyway, it's, it's been a, a radical transformation in how I, I'm mad that, that I wasn't made to learn things by heart when I was a kid, you know, just that just like it should have been a fundamental part of, of education. I, I remember nothing from from seventh grade. If they would have just made me memorize Shakespeare, at least I would remember that. You know, it's just this thing of, of we imagine people, you know, I, we imagine the things that we force people to learn will, will, will be carried with them for the rest of their lives. And often it's not. And then things that they would carry with them, it's like it's too much work, though. You know, it's just too difficult to make you spend a lot of time on one book. You know, let's, let's just do. Hey, I, I, I swear we read. Um, we, we read. Uh, we read. Um, Julius Caesar. In like three weeks. In the 10th grade. It's like, what kind of absurdity is that? Like, you know, we would have got, I would have got more out of just reading 20 lines for three weeks as opposed to like, like being forced to cram all of Julius Caesar into like a three week period. Um, it, it, it was just as a, as a 10th grader, as somebody who was completely unfamiliar with a text that's basically in another language, completely unfamiliar with the history. And so anyway, yeah, I, I read that mostly by heart. I've mentioned my eighth grade teacher, Miss Kinnean, on here before. I'll mention her again. That she made us read Ulysses by heart. Uh, I'm not sure she made everybody learn it, but maybe she gave it as an option. And I did that. It's a long poem. It's not super, super long, but it's, I don't know, I'm going to guess it's, it's 60 lines, something like that. And I wish I knew it all by heart still. I know a chunk of it. I know the opening and I know the ending, which are the best parts, I just want to say. But uh, I'm grateful for that, and I'm grateful, you know, for all the poems my dad read to me often enough that I know chunks of them by heart. Um, and I, my kids all know "Stopping by Snow" on a "Stopping by Woods in a Snow Evening." I think I have that right. I can't remember the title, but I can read the poem, <laughs> the Frost yeah, poem, yeah, yeah. And, and they they all know it by heart too. Um, still, as 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 adults, it's. Um, it is a sweet gift that's undervalued. I encourage all parents out there. And it, it's great to read. Your your poems more complex, but, you know, poems that rhyme like Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening or um, Kipling. Uh, my kids know a lot of Kipling by heart because he's so memorable, literally. He's easy to remember. He's got a great rhythm and he's – they know some Robert Service by heart. It would fall in that category also. So I encourage all parents listening there to to read poems to your kids often uh and i'd include winnie the pooh in there and and uh when we were six and not winnie the pooh when we were six the aml poems are um and, and like when like where the sidewalk ends you know yeah, like sure. i mean Chelsea, literally, like, like, yeah i i i learned that's the first poem i learned by heart years and years ago and i, I still know it you know it me pickle me tickle me too um so actually, I think it's fascinating just the, the idea of, you know, the memorization part, it almost creates a, a geographical um, connection to the oh, work yeah. and a historical connection to the work for you in, in a way that, you know, reading a reading book does too. But if you, if, if, if you know about heart, you can carry it around with you wherever you are, you know. Well, my, it's funny. I knew most of the poems I mentioned, say The Ballad of East and West by Kepler, my dad taught to me and, um, Certainly the frost stop my woods on a snowy evening. And yet those poems are in my children's beds is where I know them from because I read them to them. And uh, that's where they'll always be. And Ulysses will always be in Miss Kinnean's eighth grade class. <laughs> uh, so just the way it is. Uh, let's close with one more, if you would. Um I don't know if you know this one by heart, but uh, This Brother is Dancing in the City, which is another beautiful, beautiful poem you wrote for this new book. Actually, I know I don't know this one by heart, but it's funny. I wrote this on on my birthday um, last, I think like last year, um, after Michael A. Williams had passed. And um, it was interesting is, um, you know, I didn't know that, um, I forgot I wrote the poem. I just like I literally had forgot that I wrote the poem, and um, and then I realized, um, and I and I so I wrote it in November, and 
and I and I was asked to um, write a piece about Michael K. Williams for the New York Times for the Lives They Lived issue, and I, I, I wrote the poem. I wrote the piece, and I ended with him dancing. It was a viral video. I, I hadn't known that he was a dancer, you know, and it was this viral video that had came out of him dancing, and which is really fascinating because. Uh, he's in like a park in Brooklyn and he got on this really colorful garb and uh, and this is like so much joy on his face and he's dancing um, and everybody's like clapping and, and house music is playing. And um, and I saw this video, this viral video before he had died and I actually had a chance to meet him a little bit before that. And um, we were talking about democracy and voting in our lives. And, and he was just this really... Um, to me, this really humble, humble dude and the person that sort of helped set up the conversation. He was just, you know, I know he was a bit older than her, but he was like, man, and he was really, really respectful. And um, so my birthday, it was like late at night and I just wrote this in a, in a rush, you know, and completely forgot about it. And we were in the last stages of the book. And, and so then I wrote the piece and I completely forgot about the poem. But when I wrote the piece, I ended with an image that's in the poem. I was like, damn, that's a good image. That damn, this is a good image, you know. <laughs> and then, and then, no, and then we're working on a book. And it was like months later when I remembered the poem, and so I was like, you know what, I'm a, I want to publish this poem. So this is it. Um, before you read this it, brother, I, t- wait, before you read it, I don't I, forgive me. I don't know who Michael K. Williams was, so tell me. Oh, Michael, but I know you've seen The Wire, though, right? Yeah, I have. So he, he played. He played. He played Omar. Oh, whoa! Yeah, and he played and how, Omar. And, he, and how did he die? And it's it's actually interesting. That was part of the argument in the, um that I had with my editor. So he he um he died of a drug overdose and um, oh, during the pandemic. And um and when I was writing a piece about him, you know, I remember the the some of the I had back and forth with my editors. They was like, "Well, you know, you got to say how he died in your piece." And I was like, "I don't think I have to." And he was like. No, you you do because and I was like, but I but I wrote about you know Bill Withers and I don't even know how he died. And I was like, and I wrote about Inazaki Shange. I was like, let me just check the website. And I went to the website and I looked at a bunch of old the lives they live pieces. And I was like, yeah, frequently people don't say how people die. And he was like, and, and I was like, look, I'm not I'm not going to talk. About, uh, the last memory that I write about this 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 brother is not going to be. That he died of an overdose, and 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 um and the and the last image ended up being about him dancing because I I do think, you know, I mean when you write something, you get a chance to 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 argue about what matters, and and it's not erasing history; it's like making a case for the thing that you want to persist. And and it was interesting that like it's on, I, on and you know I called the poem on on my forty forty first birthday, that you know I'm closing my night out, and it was the image of him that that I thought um. That I thought to write about. So, but yeah, Michael K. Williams. He played um he played Omar in the Wire. He played you know a bunch of iconic characters, and um, it just was really a, a, a fascinating human being. Who um, you know, he wanted to be an actor, and he was and he was a dancer and he was choreographing. Um, and then he got in a fight and he helped a friend in a club and they got in a tussle and somebody like sliced his face open right and he almost died. But you know. It was the thing that, in some sense, um, changed the whole trajectory of his career, you know, and it's got this sort of um, people became, it, it made him distinct in a different way that carried him through his work, but he was never, but what was beautiful about it, I think, was that, you know, on a screen, um, the scar allowed him to be gentle in an unexpected way. You know, even though people people would see the scar and expect to, to be confronting somebody that was menacing, um, but I think it allowed him to be gentle in 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 in, a, in, a, in an unexpected way, in a deeply moving way. So, anyway, um, that's who the poem is is, is for. It's for Michael K. Williams um, on my forty first birthday. This brother, I should say this too, right? I did this whole thing where um, well, this has nothing to do with the poem, but I did this whole thing where I learned how to do the dance that he was doing. I can't dance, you know. I hired somebody and I, I did lessons. And I even brought my son to the lessons, you know. And um, and the reason why I wanted to do it is because I was I knew I was gonna write about it, but it's like, what does it mean to be actually alive in the world? What does it mean to walk in somebody's shoes? And and, and actually what does it mean to find different opportunities um 
to give yourself over to possibility. And, and I think that's what books are essentially is an opportunity that we take each time we pick up a book to give ourselves over to, to, to something that's deeply, deeply and meaningfully unexpected, you know, um, experience that you can't predict before having read the book. Um, and I think it's, this is maybe, um, L.A. Paul may argue with me, but I think it's one of the quintessential transformative experiences. You know, um, I don't care what you, you told me about Ulysses. I'm going to go back and read it. But it's nothing that you told me that could prepare me for what I'm going to read and the experience I have when I read it. I'm going to read it to my kid tonight just because of this conversation. But I have no idea how it's going to play out. I don't know how I'll be moved or, or they'll be moved. Um, all right. So on my 41st birthday for Michael K. Williams. This brother is dancing in the city. His bald head, the only sun some of us will see on this winter day. His body draped in the colors of heaven. And each limb living in every burrow at once. How I wanted to be free. When I tell my son about this brother and his feet moving and how a scar from his forehead to his lip was not nearly the most interesting thing about him. I think of his feet and wonder how to be this kind of honest and written in a moment, everything that matters. I want to be somebody's child again, young enough to stand before a mirror and learn moves that I believe will save me. Maybe nothing saves us except being a witness to someone else moving so free. My guest today has been Dwayne Betts. Dwayne, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. It's my pleasure, always. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.